Hello and welcome to this episode of our program Arab Affairs. Today we will be speaking about two headlines, two important headlines that took place during last week. And one of them is very, very controversial since we're speaking about a NATO member and we're speaking about another big power. We're speaking about the um, Russian-Turkey disputes. And uh, we're speaking about an escalation of words. But what we are very much concerned with is how would this really uh, reflect on the Middle East and how would this reflect on Syria? We are seeing an escalation to uh, the situation. We are seeing France uh, getting into the um, battleground. We are seeing Britain taking its um, uh, the permission of its parliament to also enter uh, into the battlefield. We are seeing a multiple uh, number of countries entering into the battlefield in the Middle East. What is this supposed to mean for the Middle East in this upcoming stage? This is one of our main concerns. Our uh, second topic we'll be uh, discussing later on, we'll be discussing, of course, about Tunisia targeted and you. We have seen uh, this uh, attack by uh, or claimed by the so-called Daesh and uh, it hit already uh, Tunisia's presidential uh, guards and it has uh, left a, a number dead plus another uh, uh, a large number of injuries and already uh, showed that Tunisia is still facing many intelligence challenges and security ones as well. We'll be discussing that later on in our show. Before we start with our uh, discussion or proceed with our discussion, let me first have this report. Russia-Turkey war of words escalate over the downed war uh, plane. Let's see the report and we'll come back for discussion. Russia threatened economic retaliation against Turkey and said it was still awaiting a reasonable explanation for the shooting down of its warplane, but Turkey dismissed the threats as emotional and unfitting. In an escalating war of wars, President Tayyip Erdogan responded to Russian accusations that Turkey has been buying oil and gas from Daesh militant group in Syria by accusing Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and his backers, which include Moscow, of being the real source of the group's financial financial and military power. The shooting down of these jets by the Turkish Air Force on Tuesday was one of the most serious clashes between a NATO member and Russia and further complicated international efforts to battle Daesh militants. World leaders have urged both sides to avoid escalation. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev ordered his government to draw up measures that would include freezing some joint investment projects and restricting food imports from Turkey. Economy Minister said that Moscow could put limits on flights to and from Turkey, hold preparations for a joint free trade zone and restrict high-profile projects, including the Turkstream gas pipeline and a 20 billion American dollar nuclear power plant that Russia is building in Turkey. Russia's defense ministry, meanwhile, said it had suspended all cooperation with the Turkish military, including a hotline set up to share information on Russian airstrikes in Syria. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said that Russia was still awaiting a reasonable answer from Ankara on why it downed the fighter jet. For his part, Erdogan told CNN that Russia, not Turkey, should be the one to apologize for the incident. And in an interview with the France 24, he said that he had called Putin after the jet was shot down, but that Russian leader had not yet called him back. Right, welcome back and proceeding on with our discussion, Turkey, Russia, what will be the upcoming stage or how will the Middle East look like and what would this uh, escalation of, uh, of war of words up to this minute uh, means to the Middle East. Let me first welcome our guest, Dr. Uh, Mustafa Reda, political analyst. Thank you very much for being with Thank us. Thank you. And um, yes. Russia and Turkey, this dispute, Turkey uh, down, uh, downed a Russian warplane and uh, 
uh, one of the two pilots and uh, uh, was uh, slaughtered by the resistance down and we uh, don't know the exactly what happened Russia says uh, it has never entered into the airspace of Turkey. Turkey says it has already entered the Russian airplane, uh, already entered the airspace, and they have given them uh, many um, warnings before shooting them down. Now, exactly how did you read this uh, incident? Well, uh, you see, uh, this is a very unexpected incident that occurred, you see, uh, but uh, at the same time, it is a case uh, that we have to take into consideration that the West was not so happy by the Russian interference in Syria. Uh, as you're aware, uh, Russia didn't, t you see, the, the, United St the Western world, Europe, headed by the United States, they consider themselves the chairman now of the world. They are, co they are considering that they are the only players since the downfall of the ex-Soviet Union. So another player coming in the political scene now today and not taking the permission of the other players in the political scene, which I mean Europe and the United States and the whole Western bloc, certainly uh, this was something very unexpected and it's an incident certainly that annoyed and caused a lot of irritation to the West. So uh, I think uh, my interpretation to this incident, it, that was it was made on purpose in order to, escape, to, to give Russia uh, an alert or a signal that they have been going off tangents, they gave, that the red button started mm. giving a light, you see, that's dangerous, you see that. And they didn't do it directly, they put uh, another country which is Probably we cannot say it's part of the European community. In some sort of part of the Arab country, you see, it's a, 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 a Turkey is, doesn't belong to the it's EU. It's a NATO member. Exactly, but it's a NATO member, as you just mm. mentioned. So, they, uh, I think there's a certain hidden agenda between the West and Turkey that they started shooting and attacking uh, these Russian planes and. Probably because you see, uh, it's not it's abnormal really that uh, you shoot a plane because it goes into the you, g you give warnings because on the other side, if you read if you saw the BBC, the, the Russians claim that they didn't receive any warnings. The West say that they gave them ten they warnings. They even said that the black boxes of the plane will show that they have not received exactly. any warnings. Yeah. Uh, yes. While the Turkish said they gave ten. Uh, warnings, 10 time warnings exactly. before, but okay, the situation in itself is uh, a little bit hazy here. It's we, very we critical. We don't really understand what's, what has went on, of course, when they retrieve the black box and the investigation. Exactly. So that will be certainly... Um, Giving us the uh, concrete results. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But if we speak about uh, the incident as part of... Um, if we take it out of the context of being just an incident. It's not an and, incident. Uh, no, no. It's an indirect message to Russia that they have exceeded the, yes, the limits. Yes, but the indirect message uh, that was carried out by Turkey. And is, this is, are we speaking about proportional powers here? Definitely. Definitely. Turkey and Russia are proportional? They I are equal you, in no, their... Uh, in uh, no, but they are proportional in another side because, the, as you just mentioned now, that, uh, that Turkey is part of the NATO and there are certain agreements between the NATO countries in uh, uh, regarding to defense and regarding to uh, military action if one of these countries is attacked in a sort of another, you see. So, uh, uh, as you, certainly, the, the, Turkey is not in the same military power or economic power as Russia, mm. but it is backed by the U.S. and by Europe, which are part of the NATO, as you just mentioned now. Mm. So, uh, uh, the, uh, in this case, we can, we could, uh, if you analyze the situation properly, uh, Turkey is considered. But at, and at this situation, part of the European uh, side. Because let us go back again two days ago. Uh, President Obama mentioned that uh, he said that uh, Turkey didn't make any mistake and it's Russia that uh, went into the air mm. field. Same uh, thing went with Britain, same with France. You see, they all, no one 
uh, condemned the Turkish uh, government or the Turkish uh, 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 president for acting like that. And on the other side, as you just mentioned, the two powers are not equal. Erdogan, uh, President Erdogan, refused to apologize. apologize. So all these signs show you that he, he can, uh, Turkey cannot act in a, in a vacuum like that without having a strong support and we don't know about it, certain, there's a certain agreement that is not announced, you see, that we're going to back you and you're going to do this and this and this and this mm. and, and the other side is not going to be able to uh, do anything, you see, mm. they won't be able to act. So let me here take it from another... Uh, angle. Angle, yes. 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 And Erdogan and this uh, uh, um, strong relationship between Turkey, the United States and, and Europe and their alliance, which is um, very much uh, questionable. I Strange. mean here, yes. mm -hmm. Turkey is a NATO member, but it is a Muslim country. Right. It has always announced itself as a Muslim country, Fine. who is a caretaker of the Muslims and the Muslim world and the Muslim causes and all this. And suddenly, there, um, they, it is making a very strong alliance with the United States, with uh, Europe, uh, with countries who have lots of interests in the Middle East. Right. So how can we really describe this kind of relation between uh, those, uh, those powers mm. and yes. Turkey? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this is a very good question that you posed, actually, that uh, certainly uh, if we look again back to the situation, uh, Turkey uh, is a member, as you mentioned, of the NATO. They are seeking to join the European community since a long time ago. But and the European community has refused exactly. many times. And they consider themselves, it is a Muslim community, as you said, they have a majority of Muslims, but they want to go really with the West. You see, they are inclined to go uh, on the direction of the West, and they are trying to, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it's just in a minute ago, they tried to join the American, European community and they were, they were refused. And now, probably by this alliance, maybe uh, the, the, uh, the, political, the, the economic and political situation of Turkey uh, being with this group will change, will pro probably improve uh, the, figure, the public figure of. Erdogan, you see, you know, Turkey has a lot of turbulences, political turbulences, mm. since the last two or three, mm. three years ago, and there was a lot the of The Turkish resistance. administration. Exactly. Not Turkey. Uh, not Turkey. Exactly. I agree with you. Mm. So there was a lot of resistance, actually, and uh, a lot of uh, discontent uh, by the Turkish people, uh, and there were a lot of troubles and all that, and there were a lot of political disequilibrium. Certainly. Uh, Turkey probably realized that uh, in order to get probably support, because now they don't have they don't have any support with the Middle East Arab countries. You see, because as you know, Turkey was against what happened in Egypt and all the Arab Springs and all that. You see, they're not with uh, they're not with what they're not in favor with what is happening here. And specifically, I would like to talk when. Uh, President Sisi, or probably the Egyptian people, I don't want to mention the president specifically, it was the will of the Egyptian people when they overthrew the Muslim Brotherhood. This certainly uh, caused a very big crackdown in the relations between Middle Eastern countries, the major ones, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, major players in the Middle East now. Mm. And all this certainly put Turkey in a certain corner that uh, I don't want to say I, it was really isolated from the world community. So they are trying to, to play a role now to have a, a sound, you see, in the international uh, political scene. So by doing this and by joining a certain group, which is a majority now and has a lot of influence, which is Europe and the US probably, uh, they might uh, get something out of it economically, economic aids, probably projects, uh, relations, things of that sort, you see. And uh, Power. Uh, uh, I was just about to say that. And uh, showing that the administration and uh, showing regime. back that we are there again, mm. that Turkey has a, a sound uh, voice in the international 
community because as you as I just mentioned the two or three years ago the political situation in Turkey was very bad and no one had given importance to what's going there in this country so they want to say we are still here we are still there and we have a say you see it's another message to the world yes we exist if we take it from the very beginning and we see Russian interference in the Syrian uh, battle and I mean Russia interference by itself. I mean here all the uh, military assistance uh, provided, are, yes. provided from Russia to Syria. And that has very much... Uh, irritated. Exactly. Irritated the big powers, particularly the US and Europe who started already to criticize Russia even before the strike. Correct. Uh, yes. And up till this minute, they are continuing on with their criticism that Russia are um, striking the opposition rather than those of uh, Daesh and uh, or the terrorists, and that Russia is supporting Bashar al-Assad on the expenses of the uh, Syrian cause and itself. democracy and all, and all uh, this. Yes, yes yeah, and yeah, all yeah. this. How do you view this whole situation, or how do you read this whole situation, uh, and? Um, how do you read the, the interference of Russia and to which extent did they really or were they really able to irritate big powers like the US and Europe? Uh, I'll tell you, uh, uh, if you look back uh, to when the Soviet Union was uh, dissolved in 1990, uh, Russia was out of, was not one of the superpowers and mm. the United States uh, which is uh, which were and Europe were controlling really the international scene. Now again, uh, Russia picked up and started showing that we are there again. Uh, they made uh, relations with Egypt now, which probably I don't think the United States is so happy that we have uh, Russian relations between Egypt uh, and Russia. The Syrian interference, as you said, so. They're trying to place a foot here in the Middle East because mm. I don't know if you will let us go back to, to uh, the 80s uh, and the 70s when uh, the late President Sadat has expelled the Russians and uh, after that uh, really because as you, as you know that Egypt is the core of the Middle East of all the countries, the Arab countries. So when we, uh, Egypt turned to the West and we expelled the Russians and they were out of, of Egypt. Certainly uh, other countries like Libya and Syria are not pivotal and do not have a strong influence in the national community like Egypt. So uh, the end result was that uh, the, the Rus Russia was out of the complete, uh, of the Middle East. Now they're putting their leg again by, uh, you see, uh, the visits between uh, President Putin and uh, President Sisi, uh, interference in uh, Syria, uh, trying to uh, insist that Bashar Assad should be there. You see, it's uh, a lot of controversy. Well, actually, Russia said that it was up to the Syrian people whether or not to keep uh, President Bashar al-Assad. It said it's a Syrian matter and that exactly. uh, it's up to them whether or not, but it is up to the Syrian people to decide. To decide. Yeah. The Syrian people, not, uh, not any other parties external to parties. decide. I agree with you. Yes. yes. When we get back to the um, Middle East and we get back to uh, Russian um, uh, interference, we see. Uh, uh, some differences that occurred to the game here. We have seen uh, Russian presidents announcing or declaring very bluntly that there are uh, countries within the groups who are fighting uh, or, or so-called this fight against terrorism are already uh, supporting uh, terrorism. Exactly. And uh, when he said bluntly that uh, the United States has said before that uh, um, the return of Raqqa for an instant would take uh, uh, 60 strikes uh, from the US-led coalition, and it only took just one or two strikes from Russia to return it back. So we are speaking about concrete steps taken by Russia. Right. And this is, doesn't uh, amuse very much. The West Definitely is not happy. Definitely it is not. Uh, Definitely it is not. Yeah. But 
how how is the U.S. dealing with this situation? I mean, here it's on the ground, and it's obvious that Russia is really taking real steps towards really ending terrorism. Okay. So, how 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 does the United States even look at itself worldwide, or well, its image worldwide has become? Uh, definitely, uh, the image of the United States has been hit, and has been. Uh, not very clear and they, they lost their credibility after all these incidents because they say that they fight terrorism they and England and specifically I'd like to talk about England and the United States but on the other side they're not taking positive actions in order to combat these uh, terrorist uh, organizations I'd like to give a very very simple example uh, and proof to what I'm saying. I don't know uh, you, if you remember since uh, four or five weeks ago, President Obama himself admitted that the, air, the Western airstrikes were, were not effective and did not uh, make any effect in order to uh, get rid of these uh, terrorists. So, well, actually, not, we were hearing from the, uh, for, from the he American uh, army, uh, whoops, we are sorry, because uh, the, those weapons went into the hands of Daesh mistakenly, and uh, whoops, uh, that was uh, wrong when we hit Did this, uh, uh, this uh, area, and it was exactly. with the uh, Syrian military, but not the terrorists, but that was also another well, mistake. And, yes, and all yes, these yes. Uh, yes, yes. mistakes. Yes. Mm. I, don't, I don't say mistakes, these are excuses. Let us be, uh, let's be very precise, you see. But uh, let us again go back to the United Kingdom. Uh, if they are fighting terrorism, how on the, on the other hand they are allowing all these terrorists that they are residing in the UK and living there and providing them from where all these terrorists are getting the money in the UK, from where they are living, from where they are financing all these operations. All this is financed by the West, you see. These terrorist organizations have been created by the West in order to create a disability in the Middle East. And if you go back to 2004, when uh, the Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice mentioned about the creative chaos. She didn't give it in detail, but she said that as the fourth generation of wars that we're, going to, we're not going to use our army like we did in Afghanistan and Pakistan and all that because a lot of, they, they got a lot of uh, disagreement and a lot of discontent by the U.S. Uh, people that a lot of lives were lost in Afghanistan and in Iraq. So they won't, they're going to use another new strategy which is uh, hitting the Sunnis against the Shias, hitting the Kurds against yeah. the... Hitting Instigating the, sedition. Exactly. And it's the self-destruction of, of the country by themselves. It's not by a foreign power or by a foreign army. Mm. It is that the people of the country themselves are going to fight, like it's happening in Syria now, in Yemen, in Iraq, in Libya, and in Syria. So yeah. in Syria you have a lot of players playing there. You see, you have Hezbollah, and I don't know, and this, and this, and also strange. Hezbollah, and, Iran from and one uh, side, and the and United States and the so-called U.S.-led coalition exactly. against terrorists. You see, Russia from, Iran one side. from one side. Yes, Iran. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, yes, many, many players, players are the on the ground. And don't tell me. Just in Syria. We're speaking exactly, about all these players playing on the battlefield of Syria. So, right. I mean, what kind of war that takes all those players in this battlefield? Number two, the other question, which is very important, I'd mm. like to pose, is for me, don't tell me that these guys have finances. They are financed by certain organizations from the West. And that's another issue that has been said by the Russian uh, president who said that um, the oils are, uh, uh, that are smuggled through the pipelines that are taken through right. Turkey. Yes. This is what and exactly the, he said. Uh, uh, and uh, taken to Europe or benefited from uh, exactly. Turkey itself. And uh, what he was speaking about, he said that bluntly anyway. Exactly. He accused uh, the Turkish administration. And the Turkish administration, of uh, course, denied it. No, said yeah, that no. uh, they don't have... Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, any information about this and denied any relation with uh, such even yesterday um, on the BBC issue. if you watched the BBC yesterday Erdogan said if we're going to finance or support uh, this so Erdogan is not going to stay in office 
if you, uh, he said, prove it. He said, yes, if you say that I'm financing, Turkey's financing mm. these terrorist organizations, you have to give me a proof. I guess then countries who are receiving oil from Turkey through their pipelines from there should have uh, this... Uh, Definitely. Uh, conscience even to... to to, do, to, to do. say that they are receiving this oil Correct. at eight dollars. Yes. At eight dollars. I heard it's five dollars. <laughs> well, yeah, it's not a big difference. <laughs> it differs from say. one day to another. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, before we move on to Tunisia, because it is very uh, critical. Uh, critical also, yes. but let me here just wrap up this whole situation and how do you view the uh, uh, interference of uh, France? And then now Britain is also on its way. Well, uh, this could lead to a very, very critical situation. And I'm afraid that if all parties are not going to start calming down this situation, I think it's going to turn into a very serious, uh, probably third world war, which I hope is not going to occur. But however, my expectations is that you see uh, the West, they have a strategy that they have think tanks, you see, and they have uh, a lot of alternatives. If this uh, alternative A is not going to work, we're going to go to B. If B is not going to work, we're going to go to C, you see. So I assume they have a lot of alternatives, but I hope, uh, I don't think that it's going to reach to a third world war because uh, we had a lot of uh, incidents where uh, the two superpowers, uh, in, uh, I gave you two examples in 1956, in the Suez War, uh, the, it could have lead to a nuclear confrontation. In 1973, also in the uh, crossing uh, of the October War and the conflict between the war the uh, Arabs and Israelis, certainly this could have, lead, could have led to an international conflict between Russia, which was still strong, and the United States. But uh, thanks God that it was avoided that it was done, uh, uh, the situation was handled in a, in a way that it didn't explode. And hopefully, I hope that this will be the case with the situation that we have just now between uh, Russia and the other uh, side. Definitely, so that is our hopes, because we really don't need a third world war exactly. from here in the Middle East. Exactly, it would be a disaster. Yes, yes. Uh, turning to this important uh, incident that occurred in Tunisia, and Tunisia was targeted and you. This time the presidential guards, and this time people were very much frightened running in the streets, and they didn't even know what was happening. Let's just watch uh, the report of what occurred in the uh, Tunisian incident, and we'll come back for discussion. Tunisian authorities have identified a bomber who targeted presidential guards in a deadly attack, saying he was a 28-year-old local street vendor. In a statement, the Interior Ministry said that forensic police identified Hussein bin Hiddi bin Adili by his DNA. Meanwhile, Tunisia's leader faced calls for to rethink their strategy in the fight against extremism following a bombing by the Daesh group on a busload of presidential guards. Tunisian Prime Minister Habib Sid said in Parliament that some of the materials used in the bombing were not available in Tunisia, but they can be found in Libya. The authorities closed the border with strife wrecked Libya for 15 days, imposed a nationwide state of emergency and a nighttime curfew in Tunis after two presidential guards were killed on Tuesday's blast. Tunisian Prime Minister Sid said that some of the materials used were from Libya. It comes after 60 people were killed, all but one of them, foreign tourists, in the two separate Daesh attacks earlier this year in the Mediterranean resort of Susa and at a national Bardu museum in Tunis. This came as Tunisian authorities have identified a Tunisian national, the suicide bomber, from Tuesday's bus attack. Interior Minister named Tuesday's bus attack as Hussam Abdelli, who is 29 years old and a distrangled Tunisian vendor, set himself on fire in 2010, sparking a nationwide uprising that overthrew the president and led to revolts across the Arab world.
Right, welcome back. And uh, we didn't go far away from terrorism, st still with terrorism in the Middle East and terrorism attacking Tunisia. Tunisia is once again uh, targeted from terrorism and from Daesh. The Tunisian attack um, has really um, given uh, um, a new view to Tunisia. Tunisia, which was, which has suffered uh, during the summer, this, right. uh, yes, of the course, this, effects, this, yes. This, this, these massacres that occurred from Daesh yeah. uh, uh, at that time. Uh, it was just uh, um, a hit in uh, for, for Tunisia at that time. Now, a new hit that is uh, uh, targeting Tunisia once again. And what does this exactly? Uh, Signify, yeah. Exactly, yeah. signifies. Well, uh, uh, if you go back to the uh, Tunisian situation, uh, since probably two or four or five months ago, there has been an agreement between all parties, including the Muslim Brotherhood uh, Party, that they're going to be out of power and uh, be, there's going to be a committee and the parliament and elections and democracy and all that. Certainly, uh, probably this didn't please uh, certain uh, powers, you see, and certain organizations like you just mentioned Daesh now, mm. that they're going to be out of the political scene in the, uh, uh, represented by the Muslim Brotherhood there, the party, they'll be out of the political scene, they'll be excluded from the political scene. So these acts, it's a normal reaction that probably they... Again, I'd like mm. to go back... Uh, uh, you know, they had an agreement, and uh, the, all the parties, and they were granted the Nobel Prize for Peace. Uh, yes, uh, this unions that, that, uh, that gathered yes. together. Yes, yes. They, they took the Nobel Prize, sure. Peace uh, Prize for, 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 for initiating this, uh, this dialogue, uh, this peace right. dialogue. And that they succeeded, and things were going Nietzsche. on the right tracks. Mm -hmm. So certainly, again, uh, there are external powers that, as we mentioned uh, just now, that did not, they want to destabilize the Middle East, which is Tunis is part of uh, the Middle East countries, you see. So uh, we saw that Tunis was going into the right track and things are calming down. So they started, as you mentioned, the hits that we had uh, in, in, summer. The, in summer and then uh, this other one just now. And probably things are going to escalate again and continue. Mm. This uh, was a hit in the core. We're speaking about a Tunisian attack right. to the presidential guards while the Carthage Film Festival is taking place. Yes, that's, that's very strange. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 So we're speaking about they are hitting specific targets. They are, they are hitting t uh, tourism. Right. Tourism in, in Tunisia, which is the first, the first economic uh, source. revenue yeah. source. Yeah. Um, that also happened in Egypt, by the way, exactly. when they With announced the that, uh, what, uh, that, that they were behind this nonsense, uh, nonsense words that were said by the so-called Daesh about uh, the Russian, Russian uh, plane. Yes. Uh, yes, plane. Yes. Of course, the Russian plane has another uh, discussion and discourse that is going on. Right. Uh, but this is exactly what they are doing. They are hitting the sources of revenues for countries. For and these countries. in addition... If they don't, if they are not uh, really um, uh, putting them uh, into the war, then they are hitting their sources of revenues and exactly. uh, trying to uh, really um, implicate uh, or complicate rather the, uh, the, the right. economic situation. And destabilize the country. And destabilize the yeah. country. Yes. Right. If we speak about Tunisia, then Tunisian or the Tunisian presidential guards and the Tunisian security has said that those people were infiltrators from the Libyan borders. Libya. That brings us to the situation in Libya and that brings us to a common, uh, a common challenge for Tunisia and Egypt together. Right. Uh, being very much subjected to attacks from this uh, western from side. western borders yes yes exactly how do you view the situation here no i uh, uh, i think that uh, probably the army are doing a quite good job now because 
they realized that, uh, you see, in Sinai, still, uh, but things have improved a lot from our eastern side, the eastern borders, you see. Mm. But still we have attacks, you see, like the attacks we had since uh, two or three days ago, the, that uh, three judge, two judges have been uh, killed yes, in this hotel, know. unfortunately. And, uh, but the real danger is not from uh, the uh, eastern borders, because the western borders are 1,200 kilometers of distance, you see. And uh, I don't know really, to be frank with you, if we have the proper devices in order to detect any intruders which might come with weapons or with terrorists or, or, or and come into the country and make uh, such actions like the one you saw in, uh, in Sinai. Probably, I assume, the one you saw in Irish, probably the guys didn't penetrate from Gaza or because this, as I mentioned, the eastern border probably is easier to be controlled because there have been certain agreements with us and Israel also because this danger is not only the, uh, uh, facing Egypt, it's facing Israel because they can start here and do uh, things on, on the other side, you see. With, uh, so probably I think uh, the danger comes from the western borders and as I mentioned, they are 1,200 kilometers and unless we have proper devices, uh, which I think uh, the army and the intelligence are taking care of that because they know they're aware that they, Libya is far, far more dangerous than the, our eastern border because Daesh controls one third of, uh, of Libya now. And there's a lot of uh, troubles there and a lot of people being killed every day. And it's, very, it's a very turbulent situation mm. and very uh, unknown. Uh, it's, we don't know what's going to happen mm. tomorrow there. You see, it's, a, it's very turbulent. So that's why uh, we should concentrate on our western border because weapons, terrorists might, might, I would say, penetrate these uh, borders and come into Egypt and uh, probably cause a lot of problems here to us. Mm. Getting back to what we were speaking about... About Tunis. No, rather terrorism, because we were speaking about terrorism. Now okay. the whole world has have gathered their arms and their uh, armies and uh, weapons and all to fight the so-called uh, Daesh influence in Syria and okay. Iraq. And um, Libya, as you said, one third of it is uh, or belong to militants and radicals. Uh, and even Daesh exists there and they are just giving a deaf ear to the situation in Libya. Right. Now, how do you view here the situation, the very, very awkward situation? I mean here, uh, yes, here they are fighting Daesh, but that is uh, also Daesh. But uh, yes, but it's maybe not as important as the one uh, uh, who are there. I, I mean, how do you read this situation? Well, uh, uh, really, again, if we go back, uh, we have to see what is the objective of the West here. Why, the, why all, this, all this is happening? The objective, the major objective, is to have the new Middle East, the great Middle East, and divide all the Arab countries uh, into uh, small units and causing continuous turbulence and troubles in these countries not using external forces, external armies, but through Muslims killing Muslims, uh, terrorist organizations causing problems, mm. you see. It is a war that, uh, uh, not against terrorism, against uh, a certain enemy that we all know, and the West certainly knows very well, and I'm sure if the West, they want to get rid of Daesh, they will do that because they know how to do it. And they could stop the finances and they could stop giving arms to these parties, different parties, you see, which are fighting with each other and destroying their country. But unfortunately, this is not their objective of the West. The objective of the West is to destabilize the Middle East, very simply. Egypt. I have only very uh, limited time here, but sure. Egypt. How do you view Egypt's role in the middle of all this? And, or how do you view Egypt's position or where it stands from all uh, the whole situation surrounding it? Well, uh, we are uh, fortunately, and uh, thanks to uh, the people of Egypt here, uh, and thanks to the army, you see, that they're playing a very, very major role, and they're uh, having a very big burden now, in Egypt in order to control our borders, in order to provide security when something uh, unusual happens. 
probably we are in a very critical city because we're in the middle of all this, you see, all of this hassle. So uh, probably it will be the role of every one of us here in Egypt that we unite the Egyptian people, uh, that we support our army, which has done an excellent job by getting rid of, I don't like to call them Muslims, because I like to these terrorist organizations which used to uh, uh, want to control the country, and it's thanks to the army and thanks to the president that he took this risk, because it was a very big, big risk. You, could, you see, you can imagine if the, if the Muslim Brotherhood had been continuing to rule Egypt, what would be the situation here mm. in Egypt? It would be but, a disaster. Yes, but now Egypt in the middle of all what is going on in the Middle East. Right. How do you view, where would Egypt's steps be in this upcoming stage? Definitely, uh, there should be, uh, you see, I'd like to back, go back to the 1973 war when we all, all the Arabs united together, mm -hmm. you see, and we were one hand, and then the West has accepted all this, and we had, we, we had... We, Actually, the West has never accepted this. They didn't accept the situation, but you see, they were shocked, because they are used, that they are all, the Arab countries are always divided. There's not, they are not united, you see. So, uh, we don't have any other alternative. Either all of these, Middle East countries and Arab countries unite and start forgetting their differences, or else we'll be all in the same boat in Titanic and we're going to sink. Very simple. Unfortunately, our time is up. I have to end it here. Uh, Dr. Mustafa Arida, political analyst, we thank you very thank much you. for being with us. And uh, dear viewers, many thanks for watching. Next Saturday, another contentious Arab uh, affairs. Until then.